Let's take a look at some of the international banking services that are offered, as well as some of the different structures for international banks. Now, international banks do everything domestic banks do, and they also arrange trade financing, um, they arrange foreign exchange, they may offer hedging services for foreign currency, uh, receivables and payables through uh, forward contracts or options contracts, and they may offer investment banking services where they're allowed to. Some of the reasons for international banking. Well, there are low marginal costs. Um, some of the managerial marketing knowledge developed at home can be used abroad with low marginal costs. There's a knowledge advantage. The foreign bank subsidiary can draw on the parent bank's knowledge of personal contacts and credit investigations for use in that foreign market. Um, home nation information services. Local firms in a foreign market may be able to obtain more complete information on trade and financial markets uh, in the multinational bank's home nation that is obtainable from foreign domestic banks. Prestige. Very large multinational banks have high perceived prestige, which can be attractive to new clients. Um, there's a regulatory advantage. Multinational banks are often not subject to the same regulations as domestic banks. Um, a defensive strategy. Banks will follow their multinational customers abroad to avoid losing their business at home and abroad. Um, also a retail defensive strategy. Multinational banks also compete for retail services such as tourist and foreign business market. Um, transactions costs. Multinational banks may be able to circumvent government and currency controls, okay, which reduces their costs. Growth. Uh, foreign markets may offer opportunities for growth not found domestically. And risk reduction. Okay, greater stability of earnings with diversification um, in different parts of the world. So here's some of the different types of international banking offices, and we'll take a look briefly at all of these. You have a correspondent bank, a representative office, foreign branches, subsidiary and affiliate banks, edge act banks, offshore banking centers, shell branches, and international banking facilities. Now correspondent bank, uh, a correspondent banking relationship exists when two banks maintain deposits with each other. The correspondent banking allows a bank's multinational um, corporation client to conduct business throughout uh, business worldwide throughout his local bank or its correspondence. Okay? Makes it much more convenient. Representative offices. A representative office is a small service facility staffed by parent bank personnel that is designed to assist multinational corporation clients of the parent bank in dealings with the bank's correspondence. Representative offices also assist with information about local business customs and credit evaluation of the multinational corporation's local customers. Foreign branches. A foreign branch bank operates like a local bank but is legally part of the parent. So it's subject to both the banking regulations of the home country and the foreign country but they can provide a much fuller range of services than a, simply a representative office. Um, branch banks are the most popular way for U.S. banks to expand overseas. Subsidiary and affiliate banks. Now subsidiary bank is locally incorporated bank wholly or partly owned by a foreign parent. An affiliate bank is much like a subsidiary bank that is partly owned but not controlled by the parent. U.S. parent banks like foreign subsidiaries because they allow U.S. banks to underwrite securities, which can be quite lucrative. Edge Act banks. These were named, this is named for um, Senator Edge, um, and these are federally chartered subsidiaries of U.S. banks that are physically located in the U.S. and are allowed to engage in a full range of international banking activities. The EDGE Act was, the, was a 1919 amendment 
to Section 25 of the 1914 Federal Reserve Act. So they put this in to allow U.S. banks to engage in international activities even though they're located in the United States. Offshore banking centers. An offshore banking center is a country whose banking system is organized to per permit external accounts beyond the normal scope of local economic activity. The host country usually grants complete freedom from host country um, government banking regulations. And the IMF recognizes the following as major offshore banking centers, the Bahamas, Bahrain, the Cayman Islands, Hong Kong, the Netherlands, Antilles, Panama, and Singapore. And you can also think about um, Switzerland. You know, you always hear about people, if you watch enough of these movies where criminals want the money transferred to their Swiss bank account or to the, or to the Cayman Islands. Why? Because oftentimes the person is not known. There's a lot of privacy there. Usually it's just a bank account number, so money just gets transferred there. You know, some of it deals with illegal activity, but that's not because the countries are supporting that, but it deals a lot with privacy. There are people who don't want others to know how much money they have and where it is, and they use some of these offshore accounts. Shell branches. Shell branches need to be nothing more than a post office box. So they, they don't really even exist. The actual business is done by the parent bank at the parent, uh, at the parent bank. And the purpose was to allow U.S. banks to compete internationally without the expense of setting up operations for real. So, you know, they just, they just have a post office box, you know, Sometimes you hear about shell corporations. A lot of times these are, you know, involved in criminal activities. But this is a legitimate way for a bank to do business overseas. International banking facilities. Um, an international banking facility is a separate set of accounts that are segregated on the parents' books. Um, an international banking facility is not a unique physical or legal identity. So any U.S. bank can have one. Um, and they've done it for things like international banking facilities have captured a lot of the euro dollar business that was previously handled offshore. Um, years ago, when the U.S., for example, had caps on the amount of interest that banks could pay, and, you know, investors... You know, either wealthy people or corporations could get a much higher interest rate abroad, they would buy euro dollars. So they're dollar denominated deposits, but they're held outside the U.S. Okay. With an international banking facility, a U.S. resident or U.S. company doesn't have to ha look for a bank overseas. They can deal with an international banking facility. So here's a little bit, a little table on the organi organizational structure of international banking offices from the U.S. perspective. So a domestic bank is located in the U.S. It does not accept foreign deposits, does not make loans to foreigners. It's subject to Federal Reserve requirements. It has FDIC insurance, and it's not a separate legal entity from the parent. Okay. Then you have correspondent um, banks, and they are not subject to Federal Reserve requirements. They do not have FDIC insurance. Representative offices, you can see, um, don't accept foreign deposits, uh, don't make loans to foreigners. They're subject to U.S. Reserve requirements. They are um, FDIC insured, and they um, are not a separate legal entity from the parent. Then you can have a foreign branch. These do accept deposits and loans from foreigners, but they are not subject to Federal Reserve requirements, nor do they have to have FDIC insurance. And they are not a separate legal entity of the parent. Um, you can have a subsidiary bank, again, can make loans and, uh, and accept deposits from foreigners. Again, looks fairly similar to the 
foreign branch, except in this case, they are a separate legal entity from the parent. The affiliate bank, again, looks exactly the same here, but as we said before, in the case of an affiliate bank, they are not controlled by the parent. The subsidiary, uh, the affiliate bank is not controlled by the parent. The subsidiary can be. The U.S. Edge Bank, or U.S. Edge Act Bank, which I, I previously mentioned, physically located in the U.S., but they can deal with uh, foreign deposits and foreign loans. Um, they are not subject to reserve requirements. They are not subject to FDIC insurance, and um, they are a separate legal entity. And of course, we have offshore banking. Okay, these would be technically foreign, and they do accept foreign deposits and foreign and make foreign loans. Not subject to FDIC or Federal Reserve requirements, and they are not a separate legal entity from the parent. And then finally, international banking facility also located in the U.S. So you have domestic banks, edge act banks and international banking facilities located in the U.S., but here again they can make far, uh, foreign deposits, take foreign deposits or make foreign loans, not subject to Federal Reserve requirements or the FDIC, and they're not a separate legal entity from the um, parent company. So you can see there are different ways to structure these um, international banks and you can see that each one serves a slightly different purpose but are quite valuable in this day and age of the multinational corporation so it allows them to work with a bank they're comfortable with that they have a relationship with but they can do it you know in their if they have a, a subsidiary in london they can perhaps do it in an office in london and it makes things much easier than having to look for, for example, a British bank.